I want the worm hat now that they brought the worm logo back. The NASA worm oh, logo. Oh, the worm, the oh, N A S A. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I want the hat. The meatball <laughs> and the worm. <laughs> I'm so bummed. I have a NASA hat. I'm not a big hat wearer. I have a very, you can't really tell from here, but I have a very small head. And I don't usually do well with hats and baseball hats because they just like feel like they're too big. But I found the perfect NASA fitting hat when I was there a year or two ago and it is gone. Oh no. Aww. I'm sure it's in the house somewhere. I, I bought one when I was there uh, when we did our NASA social many years ago and I gave it to my dad for a Christmas present and he wasn't wearing it. So I took it back. <laughs> yeah, yes, you did. That's the circular economy in action. <laughs> right? <laughs> if someone's not going to take advantage of a gift, then they don't deserve it. That's a gift, especially for yeah. JPL. No. Yeah, from exactly. Headquarters. yeah, exactly. Yeah. A bona fide. Um, there were all these things going around uh, at the end of the year about like, you know, the sort of the etiquette of regifting plus the economics of regifting and how, mm -hmm. you know, lost value and, you know, comparing that to gift cards and all those sorts of ideas. And I, I used to hold on to so many things because they were given to me and I felt bad even if I didn't wear them because I thought I should, I don't know, shepherd them, protect them. I don't know. What, what was I doing to these things? They didn't need any caring their things and yet mm -hmm. i feel so strange about saying yeah not for me so i'm glad you just acted and took it back because i think the awkwardness oh. on the receiver is the problem mostly so all right so in general what is your your general theory on regifting yes no maybe i'm all for it, it but yeah it it Depends. I always love how um, there's always the secret Santa white elephant gifts at the mm -hmm. end of the year where you're like, I have the perfect one. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, I guess it depends on, on who it is. You I'm know, so when they find out that, that you got it from somebody else. You can't do it within a group of friends. No, no. That's you, the key. You can't do it. Parents, yeah. in-laws, you know. Yeah, and it depends on how personal it is or if it was given for like a very special occasion. But that said, like some things I'm very happy to like I'd rather pass something on than have it sit in my closet doing nothing I have a great charity in uh in LA I can tell you about after that um gives you a really good uh tax credit mm. or you know good write-off I think I know so which than... charity uh, of which you speak <laughs> okay <laughs> so yeah you can most certainly donate that and and it helps at the end of the year. Hey, <laughs> and donated all good. a lot. <laughs> all good. Um, well, and also like the other thing I never realized until I was in the baby child economy because I mm. had a child was sort of the pass alongs there. And, you know, the fact that like suddenly, you know, like I was gifted maternity clothes that people passed along because obviously that's something you only wear for a finite amount of time. And it was fantastic. And then I was more than happy to pass along the stuff, you know, that I had no need for. That must have been the smallest maternity clothes ever. <laughs> like, how did you find people to like, give you your clothes? Top size. They're like, it's like child size, but you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the teen mom well, section, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> That's so mean. That's so mean. I'm so sorry. But you know they look good. Come on. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. My face is the color of my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so inappropriate. For those of you watching who may not know, I'm 4'11", so yeah, I'm on the on the wee side, but, um, but I, this is so, a good time to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Hey, everybody. I am Tamara Krinsky. I'm Hi. Taryn O'Neill. <laughs> I'm Gia. Good to see you guys. And we are the sirens. We are here to chit chat, catch up, and talk some science and um, clothing and makeup and regifting and whatever else is floating around in our minds today, which is clearly like shopping. So. Yes. And guys, I said it again. I said it again. Even with. You said guys? I did. I was like, yeah, hi, guys. What is that? Humans. What? Humans. Peoples. People. We're going to have to start like a. a sapiens. We can. Hi, sapiens. Oh, sapiens. sapiens. There you go. Ooh, like a swim Sapiens means the wise ones, basically. So I like this. Okay. Yeah. I can go with that. I can go with that. 
Sapien. Trying to figure out if it rolls off the tongue. I'm like, hey, Sapien. Not really, but. No. Well, it's good. Hey, Sape. Sape. Hey, Sape. That's how it's going to start everything. But then it sounds like vapes, and you're like, what? And, and I went to apes, which I think could Aww. be. Uh, oh, which is like the yeah opposite of sapes in a way. Yeah, yeah, right? and could yeah it could be perceived as being insulting. So maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. And we have no answer. <laughs> and we're back okay. to guys. No, we're back. But I guys. like your square jar idea, though. For every time you say it, you know, donate to Planned Parenthood or something. I don't know. There's some some system you could set up for yourself. Maybe there's like a communal Venmo that you uh, contribute to. I love that. Does that exist? Wait a minute. No, seriously, does that exist? Like a way to have a group contribution to something like micro donations? I don't know. That would be like a mean, GoFundMe. As opposed to a pa like a Patreon? Well, I know. So, okay. So you've got Patreon, which like say, you know, okay, Sirens doesn't have a Patreon, but let's say that we did. That would be something that's set up for other people to contribute to. But let's say like we as a group didn't know yet what we wanted to contribute to but we did want to reinforce this habit of stop refer of stopping referring to everybody as like hey guys so like we basically set up a virtual swear jar a swear jar where you know every time you say it, you have to contribute 25 cents or a dollar or whatever it is and then in a month whatever's in there we would decide where we were going to donate it or what we were going to apply to does that kind of app or system exist no because you have to well i don't think so I mean, Venmo has to be linked to a specific bank account. So we would have to set up some sort of a sirens account that's rooted through some bank credit card or bank. Right. Um, but I'm wondering if there's like one, I'm picturing more one end destination that like me, Tamara would contribute to when I said hi guys, or Karen would contribute to right. when she said, you know. That's a yeah. token system in a way too. So mm -hmm. we could build it on the blockchain, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, every right. time. <laughs> listening, just don't, don't don't take our idea, or do, and allow us to use. Or, it. Yeah, I was gonna say, or start <laughs> it, it so that we can yeah. start it. Like, let's all just let's crowdsource this. I like that idea. Exactly. We're not yeah. software engineers. No. But that no. could lead us to my topic that I'm bringing in today. Tell Ooh, us. Tell us, software here. engineers. What well, you got? So I'm talking about Quibi. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how many people are, are aware of Quibi, maybe because we have a lot of, of savvy sci tech, you know, fans, they know it, it's a new, um, content and distribution company that was started by Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman, former CEO of Hewlett Packard and others mm -hmm. is its, um, chief operating officer. And they launched mid-April. Um, they raised $1.75 billion in investment capital. They uh, have already sold $150 million of advertising against their content. Some of their content is $100,000 uh, a minute budget. Uh -oh. So that is akin to uh, Game of Thrones. But these are all micro episodes. So these are all episodes that are under 10 minutes and some are mm -hmm. in the format of scripted serialized series, um, usually about 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. But then there's also reality series and how to and daily news and documentary. Yeah. And at any time they have 30 different, I'm going to pull up the episode. Wrong. Hold on. What is regular like network TV? It's closer to 25 or 30, right? Or am I low? Yeah, um, a mi it, it depends. Um, right. You know, I would say that for higher end stuff, it, it does sort of hang around the 50 to 60,000 to $75,000 a minute. Um, for uh, independent stuff, it was always sort of $1,000 a minute when you were doing, when you were pitching digital mm -hmm. projects. The budget was always usually, you know, could you do it around 1,000? So if I'm remembering correctly, network dramas can be anywhere between like 300 and 400,000 on average. These figures might be a little old from when I was working at the WGA. Per screen, per minute? No. No, 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 no. Per oh, episode. per episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> because there, no, 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 no. Yeah. No, per yeah. episode because what, what always sort of amazed me when just thinking, trying to wrap my head around the business was that if you thought, okay, 400,000 per episode and then you think, okay, well, this is 20 episodes a season and you extrapolate that out, then you think about 
the size of the company that a showrunner is running. And that yeah. gives you a sense of that. You know, that's how many, think about how many people work at that sort of company if you think of the show as a company or an endeavor. But anyway. And that's usually really, deficit finance too. And so they, right. they're not even given the money to cover their full budget. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you, you um, extrapolate uh, the amount that you know those star actors are, you know, are making, which is why people don't make a million dollars an episode unless you are top top tier where everybody on friends used to make mm -hmm. you know towards the end a million dollars two million dollars an episode but yeah. that's yeah. because the ad sales against against friends and the guarantee of the, mm -hmm. the reruns and residuals were so strong well and you think of how few outlets there were when friends and seinfeld were on like there, right. there, there was know, all five the, channels yeah. Well, and, this, and there were the syndication deals, which don't, which were huge. Don't which exist. Don't, don't exist, exist anymore. So. And so this is, and Quibi is, um, you know, a, a, a jaunt down the road for this, where here you are, you're just proliferating data. I mean, they are literally throwing content out there. And initially their marketing plan was your content for on the go. So you needed to be able, you know, where, when you were standing in line at the bike, at the, uh, at the bank, at the coffee shop, um, your coffee shop, you had six minutes to watch an episode, you know, there it is. But then Corona struck and now they're trying to pivot and market it where it's like your stay at home in between your Zoom meetings, you have 10 minutes, catch up on an episode. So they've definitely tried to, to pivot in their marketing. But from a tech side, because I know we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do side tech here, they have a really um, interesting uh, video platform in that it's called turnstile. So you literally can be watching a show in both vertical format and then you can turn it this way and it will adjust within the frame to a horizontal format. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. Will you show us that in full screen and take your, um, your screen share down so we can really see the... Oh, but there's an ad because I only have is. the free version, but hold oh. on. I, I, it's okay. Two, one, zero. Woo! That's the hundred and fifty million dollars. Okay. Okay. Right. So we're watching it like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Vertical format. And then huh. we're in what we're in traditional widescreen format. Oh, that's so interesting. And but I then remember it reframes. Perfectly. Holy cow. And I oh. remember reading a piece about that. I don't, we may have even talked about it on here at one point that when he was making deals with people to shoot their shows, I they told had you that. to, yeah, that, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. So. so that's the thing is that they, so for all these big um, filmmakers, they had to be able to shoot a wider format when they were filming. And then they would have on the map box on, um, tapes of where the, the framing would be. So they would be shooting knowing that they had to be able to capture that story and what they needed to show in those two formats. Mm -hmm. Now it's really seamless. I've gone through, through it a bunch and I, you know, I basically don't even pay attention to the story because I'm just like, what <laughs> frame do they have? Look at the frame there. What am I seeing there? Like it's, it's just like a technical feat for me. Mm -hmm. But what this, um, but let me just go back to the share screen. What the article is talking about is that they're already being sued for this rotating video tech article. What? Video what? technology. So apparently, and this is um, an article in On the Verge uh, by Julia mm -hmm. Alexander, there is an interactive digital streaming company that has its own content, and it's actually the DP of the short film I did. Mm -hmm. She's, she was the DP on one of the Echo shows, but this company called Echo already had this technology, and they had... Uh, shared it at a meeting and even shared proprietary information um, at, with Katzenberg and team. And so now they're suing for this, um, for the patent, because they're saying that it's infringed patent tech. I said echo, and of course my echo is talking to me. <laughs> Not only is Jeffrey Katzenberg's ears pinging, so is Bezos. <laughs> Um, let me stop this there. So um, we'll just include this, but it's, it's, it's really interesting when you think of, you know, we, we have proliferation of content that's going on, but the way that we consume content really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, our, we all know that everybody's, you know, attention spans has reduced down to eight seconds and that something like a Quibi, even though past um, initiatives like uh, Verizon's uh, G90, what was it called? Uh, the, the, the something go. 90, go 90. Yeah. Go 90. That yeah. didn't do well. 
but you know, they just have a huge amount of money that they've raised against it. So it'll be interesting to see how this, this plays out because, you know, they could technically have to then, uh, if they lose, license Echo's technology against mm. their revenues. Yeah. And pay a huge, huge, wow. fine. huge fine. So, hmm. but then I mean, we'll, do you, we'll, go ahead. so just curious, like as using ourselves as a little anecdotal test group, focus group, do you watch stuff like the way they originally sort of marketed it? Like if you are in line at the, you know, the bank or the grocery store, do you watch stuff while you're waiting for things? Usually I would have, yeah, but more like TED Talks or, you know, little bite size, but that's what, that's what sort of pings me dopamine wise is sort of mm -hmm. educational stuff. So I naturally will gravitate towards that. People who are more geared to YouTube and Snapchat TV mm -hmm. and who want that kind of, you know, serialized experience, they very well may. I mean, the one thing about Quibi that is annoying to me is as a former web series producer is yeah. they pretend and, and you too, TK, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they pretend that they just, they just came up with this idea of web series and it's like, and micro content. It's like, we've been doing oh. this since 2007, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, you know, and they're hiring the top tier directors and they're, you know, throwing a whole bunch of money out at it. So, you know, it, there's nothing uh, original per se about it. It's just that there's a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. revenue and, and uh, not revenue, money and infrastructure that's built behind it with a cool technology. I will totally give them props that, you know, the, the display is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't actually, I don't actually like to um, generally like to watch video stuff when I'm in line or waiting around or stuff like that, because I don't like all of my senses to be here. Mm -hmm. So I love reading stuff when I'm in line. Um, I have, there's, there's an app called Pocket that allows you to bookmark stuff that like, especially when I'm working and I'm doing research and I go down a rabbit hole or procrastinating and not doing research and I go down a rabbit hole <laughs> and I find things that I want to read, but no, okay, I need to save this for later. You know, I'll just you bookmark it and then there's a little browser extension you can use. I'm not being paid by pocket. I honestly genuinely love this app. It's one of my favorite productivity apps. Um, and then, you know, when I'm standing in line, I can just pull it up and read it. And um, so I like reading things, but I don't like I don't like being unaware. I need to be able to like listen to where I am. And actually that's a really good jumping off point into my piece. I was not planning on doing that, but I'm, I'm going to take the transition. Um, so my piece today, and I will go share my screen is about robots. Uh, can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is a release from MIT News. Um, it was written by Rob Matheson. And um, it is about sensorized skin for soft robots. So, and I was intrigued by this for a couple of reasons. You know, sometimes when I pick out articles, it's because it makes me think of the future and what life might be like, and I go off into sci-fi land. Sometimes it's because it makes me think about ethical issues. Sometimes it's just cool gadgets and stuff. This one though, Actually, uh, I went down the rabbit hole because it helped me learn about a sensory system that I was not that familiar with and I actually wrote down some notes because this is all new information. So this is, um, right, let me backtrack. So MIT researchers um, have created this sensorized skin for soft robots. So, you know, we think of our traditional hard robots that do this and have limited movement, right? Part of what helps those robots figure out what they're doing and basically have a, a sense of where and how they should move is traditionally done through multiple cameras. And I had the opportunity to experience that um, when I did a shoot for Tomorrow's World Today, the show I do on Science Channel, we went to a robotics company down in Austin and I uh, challenged a robotic arm was challenged and honed by the robotic arm <laughs> that um, is set up basically to do these teeny tiny little screws like you would find, say, on like a, a smartphone assembly line. 
And um, the way that it gets the information is there are all these different cameras set up so it can figure out where it's doing, where it's going, how it's going. And you need all different kinds of cameras. So you've got that visual input coming in and they test it under different lighting scenarios in case there's shadows and it takes in all the data and then figures out the best movements. But when you're talking about um, a softer skinned robot, something that's not rigid, you want something that can actually, um, you want something that has a different kind of sensory feel to it. And it's not practical to set up a whole bunch of different cameras. So what you're basically setting up and I'm gonna go down to the picture here. You can see there, they basically created what they call like a, an elephant trunk arm. And as you can see, it's kind of moving and you can see these um, sensory areas right here, these uh, sort of flexible sensors. So what they're basically doing is they are sort of trying to create what they call a proprioception. Did I say that right? Yeah, proprioception. Pro Proprioception uh, system, which is our sensory system, the human sensory system, that helps us know where our bodies are in space. Exactly. So, you know, it's everything from like how far is your limb moving, how quickly is it moving through space. And these um, proprioceptors, which are your mechanosensory neurons and your muscles, they, and your muscles, your tendons, and your joints, they feed that information into your central nervous system, which then combines with other sensory information, say from your vision or from your vestibular system, which is the stuff, which is the system in your ear that helps you have, you know, balance or not have balance if it's not working properly. And that's how you know where your body is. Um, so I suddenly got fascinated by that because I had really thought about this system. And I went down the little rabbit hole of what is this? And um, I looked up this little video. So there's an explainer video here. Hold on, I'm gonna switch off of this. Um, what is what is proprioception? <laughs> um, little girl, oh, so cute. <laughs> But that's actually a great explanation. Pinata. So, yeah. So if you think about, so here they're doing pin the tail on the donkey. So if you think about playing pin the tail on a donkey, so you can see where your hand is, right? But close your eyes and you have to stick your hand out and stick your arm out and know, like, am I going up? Am I going down? Left, right? Like you, you have a sense of where your arm is in space. I know I'm circling right now, but how do I know that? Because my eyes are closed. I'm not seeing it. Um, that's your proprioception. Uh, that's proprioception at work. Um, and so they wanted to do that for robots. Um, so that's what this MIT piece is about. Um, and then I'll switch over into, so what they did was they um, were able to create these um, using, I'm gonna read it from here. Um, they used conductive materials that are used for electromagnetic interference shielding that you can buy anywhere, because that's always been part of the problem finding something that could be used anywhere, something that wasn't super, super expensive. And they have piezo, piezo resistive properties, which means they change in electrical resistance when they are moved and adjusted. So you can then take that feedback that you're getting and they can translate that into movement. But originally the pieces that they found were a little too rigid. So I love this. They were inspired by kirigami, which is a form of origami to that actually uses uh, cutting the paper instead of just folding. So they then cut these things up and created these patterns, which you saw in the image that I showed before, and were able to put them onto the arm. And now that arm can swing and go. And uh, they took that during testing. They fed all the information they were getting into a neural network that could then identify, okay, which of this data is just noise and which is actually actually useful. And then they um, used a traditional mocap, uh, the traditional mocap motion capture system to kind of also see what was actually happening. And they compared what, um, what was happening with the algorithm and the neural network and how it was identifying where it was in space to where it actually was in space. And that's how they narrowed down the variables that allowed the arm to more accurately judge where it was. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I will um, also say again, like this was just a big, like this was just one of those where like, I just kept looking up terms. Like I wanna remind the people who may not be as familiar with the three of us, none of us are trained scientists. We're all just 
ridiculously curious and we're all kind of research nerds. So this was a perfect example for me of something where the headline caught my attention. I started reading. There was a bunch of stuff I didn't know about. So I just started Googling like, what is this system? What is an actuator? What is, so this is the other term I came across that I now am excited about, um, ground truth data which is right. So ground truth data is that mocap system that I'm talking about. And it's a ah. term that originally comes from meteorology. So it's when you have an actual observation on the ground versus um, some kind of virtual data that you're getting. So think about tornado chasers. It's the actual observation of the person on the ground, the ground truth, versus what the meteorologists are getting through Doppler radar, for example. So they now use that in all different kinds of development. So it's checking the results of machine learning for accuracy against the real world. And it also now applies in um, things like checking the classifications that machine learning makes, say, for example, when it's marking something as spam. Mm. What is a so, soft robot? Soft robot is a robot that is... Um, think about a robot that looks more human than is just rigid and created out of hardware that is not flexible. It's a so robot it, that can move. it just means the hardware itself is flexible as opposed to like the application of it being like a, I guess I was just thinking about, we talked about those other robots that were the, uh, the baby seals that were, cause I was thinking like that was a soft robot in a sense, which certainly would benefit from a flexible system like that. My, under, my understanding, and I would have to take a deeper dive, but my understanding is that, yeah, it's meaning a flexible robot as opposed to a rigid robot. Um, because the other piece of this too, and the reason that developing this kind of system for a flexible robot is so important, is that a flexible robot ostensibly would have so many more ways that it could move, as opposed to a rigid robot, which is movement is more limited. And so a camera system can be if you're rigid, then you can use a, a vis just a visual system. But once you get into infinite possibilities, you can set up that many cameras. And then ultimately, of course, you know, if they can figure some of the stuff out, it could have amazing applications like limb replacement, you know, for veterans, folks who have um, been in accidents, things like that. So yeah, if you out there watching have uh, knowledge about soft robots and their applications in the world that we don't know about, please let us know. Yeah, please. And I'm curious about how it's going to um, impact virtual reality, because mm -hmm. that's like a haptic feedback system mm -hmm. that you can, you know, so actual virtual builds within a virtual world will be able to potentially give more feedback to the system as to where they are, which could have applications in the real world. I don't know. That's where yeah. my brain went. Yes. And sex dolls, obviously. Sex uh, dolls, well, totally. Course. It all goes back to sex dolls. <laughs> Beginning Gia, ends you're right there. Today. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the good thing is I have a good pivot, which is that I found it on Pocket TK. So oh, you're is, kidding. No, that's our little connection here, which is so awesome. I'm not a Pocket user, but on Firefox, which PS was created by a woman, um, uh, oh. one of the like little, uh, you know, your home screen pop-ups, one of the suggestions was this piece. And so I want to warn people that there is animal testing involved in this. And as an ethical vegan, I'm the first one to sort of feel uncomfortable in these situations. However, I am vehemently against animal testing in cosmetic applications and believe there needs to be a lot of other changes um, regarding legislation in that regard. However, in scientific application, what else are we to do other than to study animals? And so in the sense, that's what the testing that's being done here is. However, um, it's a little more complicated than that because what they were doing is dunking octopi into a vat of ecstasy water. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Get out. Yeah. I mean, and they have multiple neurons in their neuron hubs in each of their arms. Oh, I can't wait to hear. I was going to make a, is that an octopus in your pocket or are you going to make a <laughs> joke? But once you bring in the, I mean, there's, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's so great. Cool. Yeah. Oh, and it's Ed Young, so hello. Of course, and in, in the Atlantic, of course. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we have our favorites. We don't even mean to stumble on that they clearly speak to us in ways that um, other information doesn't. So anyway, uh, what's fascinating about this California two-spot octopus, um, they, uh, they took a vat of water and a vat of ecstasy-filled mm -hmm. water, and they take the two different octopi, and they dunk them, and then they put them in a tank with other octopi, 
or pusses. I'm sorry. I want to say octopi because it just gets too funny when octopuses, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but they were more, what they found out is that the more social uh, an octopus was, was determined by how much more ecstasy they had, that they would be in the tank and they'd be just sort of sitting there not interacting with each other but they would take them out and dunk them and then put them back in and then they would come around and so they said they're, they're not entirely sure if it's the ecstasy that's doing that or the fact that they'd already been in the water with the other octopuses um so they're not entirely sure but it was really interesting because they have dun, 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 where is it brains shaped like donuts and i just thought that was <laughs> so amazing. Um, and they also said that they're more sociable, less defensive. The same effect occurs in rats and mice. So we see a lot, you know, we're getting a lot of information because like you said, Taryn, they have so many um, amazing intelligences and neurons and their brains are very different. They're shaped like snail brains. Apparently. Yeah. I mean, I know you're vegan, so I almost feel bad saying this in front of you and I don't eat <laughs> shellfish or cephalopods anyway. But of course my brain did go to the idea of like ecstasy infused calamari. And if there's a market for that, Oh, well, that is how squid. Is, say, don't they just, isn't that what Burning Man is? I'm pretty sure that's like. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I figured. But I thought this was so cool because I, um, I always like when they're having the World Cup and they have the octopus pick Choose the teams. The, yeah. I always feel badly better. that they're in a tank some, somewhere, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love they that are, book yeah. by Cy Montgomery, The Soul of an Octopus. It's honestly one of my favorite books. Oh, we have to link to it. I don't know it. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. They can, they can identify you, you know, because they have taste receptors on each of, you know, all of their arms. And so they know who you are when they, um, <gasps> you know, when they say hi, they basically, that's why they wrap their arm around your arm because they what? can taste your um, signature basically. And yeah, and it's say how like if you were if a smoker, they would put their arm on a smoker and they'd be like, ah, and they would pull back and change color because oh they gosh. could taste the toxins in the blood. <gasps> It's such a magical book. Oh, cool. Okay, what I'm kind of loving about this moment, and it just hit me as I'm watching, is Gia, your, um, I don't know if it's your lamp, is that a lamp right above you? Oh, yes, over here, yeah. So your lamp um, sort of looks like an undersea creature, it's kind of like <laughs> rotating, and you've yeah. got the plant right behind you, and the yeah. TV, so it almost looks like you're, because my mind is now on the sea and the ocean, it almost looks like you're in an aquarium right now with things. <laughs> I know, it's so true. Uh, you know what I was thinking about how talking about being caught in a, a, a cage or a, a tank you know we all sort of you know during quarantine tank. yeah we're sort of in our little tanks and we're we're uh, cordoned in by these zoom boxes you know that we're just stuck in right. I mean, that's the reason I have uh, not that I have zero interest in Quibi but why I certainly can't like get all excited about Quibi is all we do is stay on screens all day long <laughs> And I don't want to see any more screens anymore. I love you all so much, but I never want to see another screen in my life. <laughs> well, Zoom fatigue is real, that's for sure. So, I mean, yeah. Zoom, we love you. Thank you. Very grateful. Yeah. But yeah, getting but, yeah. your eyes off of that thing is, is important. Are we going to do a rapid fire? Things that we... Um... <gasps> yeah, lightning round. Lightning okay. Round. What are you... All right, Taryn, what are you watching, reading, et cetera, right now that you'd recommend? Um, I just started reading uh, Kevin Kelly who is the co-founder of Wired. He is a futurist, he is a writer, um, a huge thinker, and he just turned 68 um, on the day that this is recording, and he just put out um, a list of 68 uh, sort of ideas of, uh, just, I don't even know what it's called, basically like words of wisdom, lines of wisdom. Oh, cool. And I started reading them, and they're, and they're really great, like just really wise um, and funny and smart. Nice. Gia, what about you? Uh, obsessing on economics right now. So I've been binging Planet Money and Freakonomics. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Nice. You and I went, oh, I went in the totally opposite anti-academic direction. Um, I'm binging on a show called The Bold Type, which is <gasps> yeah. on it's so good. Um, it's on Freeform. Um, I'm watching season four. It's about three gals who work at a, uh, well, it's now a digital outlet. Um, and it is a, ma it was a magazine, sort of an iconic women's magazine. Uh, the, the three women that it follows are in their like mid to, mid to late twenties and they're dealing with life in the city and careers and lots of sex questions and things. And I just, I really like it because it sort of, to me, satisfies that like sex in the city place. Um, 
you know, and they're, it's very forward thinking. It's very progressive. They deal with, you know, current issues of identity and gender, but in a super fun way. So um, I'm going to jump back into that. I think I deserve a little break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, that's what it was. I needed a little bit of a break from the news and from the anxiety of what's next. And it's purely escapist and I love it. Yay. That's awesome. Okay, love you, ladies. Love, love you, ladies. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks for coming.